Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Dive into Spring at the HarperCollins Children's Book Spring 21 Book Preview. I'm Sarah Hunter, the editor of the Books for Youth section at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions, and we'll pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. For the best viewing experience, we recommend watching the webinar in speaker view. To change your viewing preferences, select view in the upper right corner of your screen to switch to speaker view. Links to today's slides and title lists were included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the links located there. You can also download these materials at any time by copying the URLs on this screen into your web browser. Today, we'll have the pleasure of hearing from some wonderful authors, but first, let's meet the HarperCollins Children's School and Library Marketing team. First is Patty Rosati, Director of School and Library Marketing, Mimi Rankin, Marketing Manager, and Katie Dutton, Marketing Associate. Thank you all for being here today. And without further ado, I'll pass it along to Patty. Thank you. And I'm so glad um, to be here with everybody today. Um, before we get to our guest author speakers and, and before we tell you about some of our big summer titles, I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes talking about Shake Up Your Shelves. This is a campaign that we launched late last year that focuses on aspects of diversity and inclusion that are of particular interest to teachers and librarians. Currently, our content features practical tips and strategies for looking critically at the books you're sharing with your students and shows how you can shake up your shelves by retiring books that are offensive or outdated and by adding titles that reflect the experiences of more underrepresented groups. We add new content every couple of months and our next update will include a deep dive into unconscious bias and an expansive new diverse title list. You can see here on this slide samples of what that looks like on the right hand of the slide. We have downloadable posters like the Black Voices Matter and Pride poster that you see here and we invite you to print them and post them in your library or classroom. Um, we know some librarians have done this uh, with they, they download the poster and then they set up a, a related uh, content book display. Um, and it, it looks pretty great. We're also gonna be shaking up summer reading with title lists and other goodies that will help you refresh your summer reading title lists that you share with your students and patrons. We have all of this plus author videos, educator guides and more. Um, and all of it is available now. And again, as I mentioned, we do update things periodically. You'll see the URL there. So please um, take a look at that or consider following Harper Stacks on social media where you'll get alerts to new content and virtual event updates. Or you can email Mimi, her information, her contact info is on uh, today's final slide um, and we'd be happy to get you more information. And then the last note before we get to it is we're gonna present just a sampling of uh, some of the big titles that we're publishing in the summer. We've got lots more goodies. So um, we will have an Edelweiss link uh, that you'll receive tomorrow in the email. And I think Mimi popped it into that chat box. Um, that's where you should go and take a look at all the other books that we have. That's also where you go to download AREs and to take a look at the picture books that we're gonna talk about today. But to start, we're going to start with teen. Now, normally at these events, we start with picture book, but we're going to mix it up a little bit for UYA librarians and those teachers that work with older kids. Um, and we're going to kick things off with a, uh, with a talk from one of uh, the best writers working today. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Patty. Uh, so we're kicking off the preview today with a talk from one of today's most critically acclaimed and popular writers of children's and teen books, Rita Williams Garcia. Rita Williams Garcia's middle grade novels have become beloved classics, winning a Newbery Honor, a Scott O'Dell Award, a National Book Award Honor, and three Coretta Scott King Awards. Her teen titles, like Every Time a Rainbow Dies, No Laughter Here, and Jumped, have been similarly lauded and have many fans. This year, Rita returns to her YA roots with a new historical novel, A Sitting in St. James. Here's what our book list reviewer said in the start review for A Sitting in St. James. Equal parts history and tantalizing chaotic drama, Williams Garcia's stunning novel delivers a fresh and nuanced approach to the tale of American slavery. 
monumental, a definite cause for celebration. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Rita Williams-Garcia. Hello. Next. Patience. Next. There is no story without history. Next. But before we step foot on Le Petit Cottage in St. James, Louisiana, we must first, next, acknowledge the indigenous people who populated the land that thrived centuries before Europeans came. Next. Again, we must go back to history, this time to the French Revolution, where a 13-year-old girl is deposited at, um, at a convent uh, by the royal family, and she is given a choice, marriage to a pig farmer, a pig farmer, a peasant farmer <laughs> turned, uh, turned I'm, I'm sorry, a uh, pig farmer just made me laugh, a peasant farmer turned sugar lord in Haiti or face the bloodthirsty mob. She chooses marriage and, um, and Haiti. So the revolution is not through with her yet. This girl, now a woman, and her husband and his gold are forced to flee Haiti for Louisiana. Next. And here we are. It's 1860 and Madame is now 80 years old. Um, her name, her full name is Madame Sylvie Benadon de Marais Dacier Gilbert. She has been through enough. And because of that, she feels that it is time for her to have what she wants, to have what she is entitled to. And one of those things is a, to have a portrait sitting, not just painted by anyone, but she wants her portrait to be painted by a Frenchman. And as luck would have it, um, the, uh, the descendant of Marie Antoinette's um, royal portrait painter, uh, Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun, is in Louisiana. And so um, this is where we get the character, the fictitious character of Claude Lebrun, the painter. And so um, Madame will get what she wants. Um, but this is not her only entitlement. For her 70th birthday, she gifted herself with a then six-year-old child, which she took from her parents' cabin and then renamed her Thisbe, or she would say Tisbe. Uh, and the girl's, um, the girl's primary job is to stand for 12 hours a day in tight black shoes. Now, although Madame's son is the master of Le Petit Cottage, um, well, that's only in name only because Madame holds all the power because she knows where her husband's gold is buried. Now, she gets what she wants, but what she wants, what she feels so greatly entitled to, has great impact on everyone's lives at Le Petit Cottage, especially Thisbe's, or I could also say next, especially, oh, um, that's Thisbe. Um, I could also say next. It has great impact on her son, um, Lucien, 55 years old, who is desperate to save the plantation at all costs. Or I could say that it greatly affects next, his son, Byron, a West Point cadet who is engaged to the colonel's daughter, um, but he is in love with, next, fellow cadet Robinson Pierce. And they will stay together in, a, in an apartment that's separate 
from, um, separate from the main house. Uh, and it's called a garcinier, which is very typical of well-to-do plantations in Louisiana. But Byron is not the, Byron is the sole heir, but he is not the sole sibling of the Gilberts. Next, there is Rosalie, who is Lucien's daughter and also his property. She is a quarter, um, uh, she is, uh, has one quarter black blood, um, which back then she would have been called a quadroon. Um, but that what but that three quarters of non-black blood is not enough to satisfy Madame Gilbert and quiet as it's kept. No, she is just not French enough for Madame. Um, so uh, Rosalie is banned from Madame's sight and from her house even though uh, Lucien has great plans for Rosalie uh, and plans that will help to save the plantation. But little does Lucien know, Rosalie has dreams of her own. She is armed with needle, thread, ambition, and she also have a couple of choice books in her pocket from the works of Victor Hugo, Mary Wollstonecraft, and well, of course, Jane Austen. But she is, while she is still unwelcome in her grandmother's house, next, there is Jane. Uh, Jane, an abandoned plantation daughter, um, who Madame is desperate to turn into a young lady and make her societal debut. So Jane is a welcome boarder in Madame's house. However, all Jane really wants to do is ride her horse, wear her dead father's war clothes, his uniform, and maybe have another, um, another uh, chop put on her plate. So Jane is just another person, next, for Creole maids Marie, and Louise to clean up after and to serve. Yes, they clean all the dirt, they empty all the slop jars, but they know where all the secrets are. Um, and they make sure that they stay clear of, next, Lily. Lily who suffers no fools, but who also cooks for the very people who murdered her son. Next. So why would I tell this story focusing on white slave holders uh, mainly and not on, um, not on African Americans that I have descended from? Well, <coughs> excuse me, the enslaved could not eradicate slavery on their own in the 1800s, um, any more than people of color today can eradicate racism on their own. So I put the focus on those who hold a certain amount of power. And, um, and so that's where the story, um, that's where the story is told from. Now, this is not my family's story, or it's not the um, story of anybody that I know. Uh, it's it's complete fiction, but I, I my intent is that it allows us to have safe and uncomfortable conversations about the past that continues to seep into today. I uh, next. I took a year off before I even began writing. I took a year off to do the, um, the research. I had so, so many different areas to cover and to immerse myself in. Well, first of all, I really had to know something about, um, about Louisiana Creole culture, 
Louisiana Creole identity. Um, I had to know, understand something about Francophone languages and food. Well, of course, it's my, one of my favorite subjects is always about food. Uh, but again, I had to know um, how is it prepared and how is it preserved and how do we get it from the cookhouse which is separate from the main house into the main house. Um, so that was that was a journey within itself. Um, I also had to know um, about the life and the thoughts and the concerns of a sugarcane planter. Um, and uh, not only that, but I had to know uh, kind of, well, what would a 19th century portrait painter know and a master portrait painter at that? I drowned myself in West Point culture from academic coursework uh, to pranks, slang, demerit systems, what they wore, um, um, their camp, um, the furlough system, all of that, just to kind of get a sense of, um, of the two um, characters who would be West Point cadets. Um, now, it was also a little fun for me because I, I come from a military family. Um, we have been in service to this country uh, since the Civil War where we fought and died um, up until um, Desert Storm. I am a Desert Storm wife. Um, so yes, yeah, so uh, just really kind of drilling into the military history um, and, uh, and um, West Point culture really helped me to shape um, both uh, Byron and, um, and Pierce, and to understand something about um, West Point um, tradition that they might have pride in. Although enslaved people were um, in the background of this story, I kept them close to me by always reading narratives um, and, and hearing the recordings of the survivors, um, the ancestors who survived, um, and, and lived to, um, to talk about and to record their, uh, their struggle, their lives. Um, there's something to be said for, the, uh, for federal programs that sponsor and employ unemployed people um, who then go out and do this work of collecting these stories and then that then become archives that we have today. Next. Then, then after the study, then I began to write. Um, and I, I am a handwriter. Um, these are the books that I wrote this story in. There is, um, there is some, um, some research. You, you might see the little sticky tabs on the tops of my Moleskine uh, notebooks. Um, and uh, yes, I'm a faithful uh, gel to pen user, um, but I have to, I feel like I have to handwrite next. Yes, you can, you can play, yes. Um, um, I, I really do have to handwrite because it's really the only way that I feel the rhythm of what my character's journey is. And, um, and um, just, I start to really, drop down into the story and be there with them when I'm actually kind of stirring the gumbo, writing the words. Um, next. So the inspiration for a sitting in St. James comes from three places. It comes from a dream, a daydream, and um, a very real little boy, well, young man now, um, who um, attended a screening of uh, a Stanley Nelson's documentary on the Black Panther Party. And during the, uh, the Q&A, he asked, why, why do they hate us? Since I was there for the children, I was there to answer. So I said, it's because when they see us, they don't see a human being. And even though, to be honest with you, I did not want to write this story. I did not want to write about um, uh, this period in our history, but I felt as though I needed more of an answer for this young, uh, for this young man. Um, and, and so I began to really um, think about the people who felt 
um, entitled to own, sell, use, um, separate families and um, torture and even kill a uh, black people. Um, now, villains and um, uh, villains are and you know like um, monsters. They're easy to create, uh, but they're also easy to dismiss as real uh, people in history. So I thought that it was important that um, that we got to know the Gilberts, their life and what was important to them. So if I've done my job at all as a writer, you will feel for the Gilberts, the slave holding Gilberts. Um, you will curse them. You will be disturbed by them. And, and at times you might even root for them, um, but just know that they are playing their part in American history, in American history that we are still feeling today, and that they have also played their part in telling a sitting in St. James. I thank you all. Oh, Rita, thank you so much. Um, you've, uh, that was amazing. Um, we're so glad that you stirred that gumbo and that, you, uh, that the result is a sitting in St. James. I, I think it's a true masterpiece, and I cannot wait for uh, those of you who are listening today and, and beyond uh, to, to read it. It's, it's an extraordinary book. Uh, let me tell you about a couple of others. Um, pumpkin, Pumpkin. Uh, here is where we return to Julie Murphy's beloved world of Dumplin'. It's fabulously fun. It's a fin final companion novel. This one's about drag, prom, and embracing your inner queen. Uh, next slide, please. For fans of Jane Austen and of classic retellings, you will enjoy this take on the beloved novel, Persuasion. This story about the power of music and first love is set on gorgeous Tobago. Funny, sexy, full of longing, this is a perfect summer read that marks the debut of Sarah Doss, who has lived in Tobago since she was two years old. Where the Rhythm Takes You is inspired by her own childhood, where, which she spent in a seaside hotel. We have another retelling coming from Sarah in summer 22, and that's based on her favorite play, Much Ado About Nothing. Next slide. A power outage, a sweltering summer night, and six love stories flickering in the dark. Brimming with black teen joy and swoony, rom swoony romance, this blockbuster book containing intertwined stories by six of today's most renowned YA authors will glow in the hearts of readers everywhere. We will publish with lots of fanfare in June. Uh, just a quick note on this is that it's not yet in our Edelweiss catalog, but it will be very soon. Um, so check back, I'd say in a week or two. Next slide, please. A heart-wrenching own voices novel about a Muslim teen struggling to hold on to hope and her beliefs in the wake of 9-11 and a family tragedy from the author of the best-selling Shatter Me series and a very large expanse of sea. This is an emotion of great delight. Our friends at Booklist said this in their starred review of Tahara's new book, a bluntly powerful read that shouldn't be missed. Next. Many of you are familiar with Elliot Schrieffer. He's a New York Times bestselling author, has twice been a finalist for the National Book Award and so many other accolades. He's also one of the greatest human beings on the planet, in my opinion. His novels include Endangered, The Lost Rainforest series, and his new series for young readers, The Animal Rescue Agency, to name just a few. The Darkness Outside Us is Elliot like you've never seen him before. Here he presents a genre-bending, pulse-pounding mystery sci-fi adventure with a fantastic queer love story that will keep you guessing every step of the way. Uh, next slide. And last but not least, two new books by wildly popular YA authors. First is The Betrayed. Kira Cass brings another sparkling romance to a stunning conclusion in this sequel to the instant number one New York Times bestseller, The Betrothed, and Realm Breaker. This electric new fantasy series from Victoria Aveyard, who's the number one New York Times bestselling author of Red Queen, has high voltage action, deadly twists, and an adventure for the ages. Again, those are just a, just a glimpse of some of the offerings that we have coming from Teen. Please do check the Edelweiss catalog for many, many more books. And we're gonna pop it over, I think, to middle grade now. Thanks.
Thank you. Um, so next up, we have uh, an author talk from New York Times bestselling author Erin Entrada Kelly. She was awarded the Newbery Medal for Hello Universe and just a few months ago, a Newbery honor for We Dream of Space. Erin grew up in Lake Charles, Louisiana and now lives in Delaware and teaches at both Rosemont College and Hamlin University. Erin is a true superstar when it comes to capturing that unique and authentic feeling of coming of age. She has said, I want young people, especially the quiet, overlooked, lonely kids out there to know that they are seen. Aaron's new book, Maybe Maybe Marisol Rainey, is geared toward a younger audience and includes Aaron's own illustrations throughout. Our book was reviewer loved this one too and said in the starred review, an immediately engaging and ultimately rewarding choice for readers moving up to chapter books. Please welcome Aaron and Shrata Kelly. Thank you so much. I am so thrilled to introduce you to Marisol today. It's always exciting when a new book is released, but this book is particularly special to me and I wanna explain why. And as I share the background of this book, you'll get to know Marisol a little bit better and me as well. So when my editor and I discussed the possibility of a series of books for younger readers, I was immediately excited. Um, and that excitement quickly turned to uh, frustration and fear because I was writing for a younger audience that I wasn't accustomed to. Um, I couldn't quite find Marisol's voice. I really struggled. I thought a lot about the books that were out there like Clementine and Ramona, all the books we love. And I couldn't quite figure out how my authorly voice fit into that universe. So one day, um, back when we could see people, I was in my editor's office in New York and I confessed to her that I just could not find Marisol's voice. Uh, I was trying to write a really precocious kid, but I wasn't a precocious kid. So I, I just couldn't figure out what I was doing. And my editor said, why don't you just write about yourself at that age? And I immediately scoffed. And I said, no one would want to read that book. I was not interesting. And she said, I don't believe that for a second. And I said, I was too afraid to even climb a tree. Um, and she just kind of gave me this, this long knowing look, right? So on the train ride home, I realized something. I realized that Virginia was right. Uh, I was an interesting kid, not because I'm uniquely interesting, but because we all are interesting, every single one of us. And just because I didn't take up a lot of space when I was a kid, just because I was quiet with my nose in a book did not make me any less interesting than any other kid, right? So on the train ride home after that meeting, I started thinking about myself um, as a kid, as a seven or eight year old kid. I thought about how I would get up in the middle of the night because I couldn't sleep because sometimes I would have the worry wart brain. I mean, sometimes I still do. Um, and I couldn't sleep. So as a, a little girl, I would get up in the middle of the night and I would sneak into the living room and I would turn on the TV and I would turn on AMC, American Movie Classics. And they would show silent movies in the middle of the night. They would show Charlie Chaplin specifically in the middle of the night. And I would sit there cross-legged on the carpet and I would watch these Charlie Chaplin films. Um, you didn't need sound to watch them, so I wouldn't wake anyone up. And I would just sit there and I would, I, I would cry and I would laugh. If any of you have ever seen a Chaplin film, you know what I'm talking about. So on this train ride, I started thinking about that. I started thinking about how when I was a kid, I fervently believed that all inanimate objects had feelings. I would talk to the furniture so the furniture wouldn't feel lonely. I would apologize to the door if I closed it too hard. Of course, all my stuffed animals had, had feelings and thoughts and emotions. So I started thinking about how I would put my stuffed animals on rotation. So all of them would get an opportunity to sleep with me in the bed. That way, none of them would have their feelings hurt. I thought about how much I loved my best friend, Roz, uh, with a depth that can only happen between elementary school BFFs. I thought about how grownups often told me I was too sensitive and I came to believe that being sensitive was a bad thing. Uh, I thought about how afraid I was of so many things and it seemed like I was the only one who was afraid. I was afraid to put my toes in the ocean, even if I was holding my mother's hand because I was convinced I'd be swept away. I was afraid of escalators. I was afraid of going downstairs. I was afraid of baseball and sports. I was afraid of breaking a bone. I was afraid of trampolines. And I was afraid of climbing trees because I was convinced I would fall. So I took all these things and created Marisol. So Marisol is basically me 
at eight years old. She is half Filipino, half white. She has an older sibling. She lives in Louisiana, uh, where I grew up. She gives names to all the inanimate objects in her house, which is something I still do. Like the, the, the desktop I'm talking to you right now on is named Theo, Dr. Theopolis. Um, she loves silent movies. She loves her stuffed animals. She loves her best friend, Jada. And there is a magnolia tree in her backyard that she is afraid to climb. So once I knew Marisol, since I am Marisol, her voice came to me clear as a bell and I started writing. Um, so Mary, maybe, maybe Marisol Rainey, the first book in the series is about Marisol, who has a tree in her backyard that everyone considers the perfect tree for climbing. And everyone climbs it except Marisol because she's too afraid. The tree is named Pepina, because remember, she gives names to everything. Um, the book has humor, it has heart, it has triumph, it has self-doubt, and it also has illustrations, which brings me to another reason why this book is so special to me. And I'm going to bring it back to my editor again. Uh, so Virginia, my editor, knew that I could draw. Um, I drew doodles and sketches and I would post them to social media. And she had this brilliant idea that, oh, you could illustrate the book too. And I said, uh, sure, yeah, I can uh, illustrate uh, the book. That sounds great. Uh, and of course, in the back of my head, I'm thinking, I can't illustrate a book. What, what's happening right now? Um, so the frustration set in again, right? The self-doubt, and it really nestled deep in my bones. And there's that little voice over my shoulder. And we all know that little voice whispering, why are you illustrating a book? You're not an illustrator. You just draw doodles when you're bored. Uh, it took a lot of work to quiet that voice and it's still ongoing. So my levels of, of self-doubt and second guessing whilst illustrating this book were out of this world. I was afraid, but I was also determined. Um, so anytime I was invited to speak at conferences, you know, often, often these conferences would have illustrator panels or illustrator workshops. And I would attend those, you know, one time I gave a keynote at an SCBWI conference. And after the keynote, I walked with the attendees next door to where there was an illustrator workshop. And I sat down and I was taking out my notebook. And this woman said, didn't you just give the keynote address? And I said, yes. And now I'm here for this illustrator workshop. Um, so I know a lot of illustrators in the Kidlet universe, of course, and I would bellyache to them and ask for their advice. And they were so encouraging and so uplifting. I can't even begin to tell you. Um, they convinced me to stop doing air quotes when I said illustrator, right? Uh, Ari Chung told me it's just about shapes. You know, all pictures are shapes. Gordon James told me you have your own style and that's what matters. You can't paint the way I do, but I don't draw the way you do. And that's what's important. Uh, Luen Pham told me just keep drawing Marisol. Who cares if you can't draw a realistic bowl of fruit? All you need to know is how to draw. Marisol. So I took all their advice, the feedback of my editor, the art team at Harper, all these online classes, and eventually the illustrations came together. Uh, I have no training other than my tears, but uh, I would love to share some of these illustrations with you now um, because I'm so proud that, that the book came together, right? And you'll notice some things that are familiar. So here's Marisol uh, with Charlie Chaplin. I never thought I'd be able to, to bring Charlie Chaplin into uh, my work as an author, my love for Charlie Chaplin, but he's saying, can I get my hat back? Um, and then we have, this is the sofa at Marisol's house. Uh, she has named the sofa Betty Big Mouth because Betty, um, of course, eats the remote controls and the phones in the house. So that's Betty Big Mouth as she sees her. Um, this is Marisol and Jada, and not surprisingly, uh, Marisol and Jada, neither of them are good at sports. Uh, this is Marisol trying to jump rope. Um, I was terrible at sports. I PE terrified me, uh, still does. So uh, here's Marisol with her stuffed animals. So Marisol loves cats, um, as I did. So here she is with all her, her five uh, stuffed animal cats and her one uh, real cat whose name is Beans. So she names her stuffed animals after her favorite food. So their names are pot roast, lumpia, nachos, uh, and high C. And her cat is named Beans after jelly beans, which is another of her favorite foods. 
Um, and then here we have, I mean, we all remember those best friends from childhood. Um, you know, even when you create passwords, right? One of the one of the security questions is, who is your best friend from childhood? So of course we have, uh, here's Marisol and Jada. And Jada is based off of my best friend, as I said, her name uh, is Roz. And Jada is an aspiring philosopher. She's very, very smart, as was Roz. And Roz actually went on to become a, an attorney and a state legislature, state legislature for um, Louisiana. So this is maybe, maybe Marisol Rainey. And um, there's so much of myself on every page. And, you know, the re one of the reasons why I'm so excited to talk to you about it today is that this book not only helped me appreciate who I am as a writer and being able to stretch my creative wings and break outside of my comfort zone, um, it also helped me appreciate who I am as an illustrator and continue to be, uh, but it also helped me appreciate who I was. When I was a kid, I often felt very invisible, voiceless, uninteresting. Uh, I believed that I was too sensitive. I did not believe in any way that I was an important force in this world. And now I know differently. And my hope is that other errands and Marisols in the world find themselves in these pages too. It was such a joy to write. It was such a joy to illustrate. It was just a joy to bring Marisol into the world. And it is a joy to introduce her to you today. So thank you for being here and listening to my spiel. I hope you love her as much as I do. All right, thank you so much, Erin. That was absolutely wonderful. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mimi Rankin. I'm a member of the school and library team, and I'm going to tell you about some of the middle grade titles we have heading your way this summer. Um, as a reminder, these are available as e-galleys on both NetGalley and Edelweiss. So first up, we have The Shape of Thunder. This is an, an extraordinary new novel from Jasmine Warga, Newbery Honor winning author of Other Words for Home about loss and healing and how friendship can be magical. Cora hasn't spoken to her best friend Quinn in a year. Despite living next door to each other, they exist in separate worlds of grief. Cora is still grappling with the death of her beloved sister in a school shooting, and Quinn is carrying the guilt of what her brother did. Uh, when Quinn thinks she has found a way to stop that terrible day, she enlists a hesitant but curious Cora, and the two find that leaning on friends may be the key to healing. This book is gripping and such an age-appropriate exploration of grief. Uh, it's really a bridge to Terabithia for a generation all too familiar with the threat of gun violence in schools and elsewhere, as we know. Next. Next is Da Vinci's Cat. Two unlikely friends, Federico in 16th century Rome and B in present day New Jersey, are linked through an amiable cat, Leonardo da Vinci's mysterious wardrobe, and an eerily perfect sketch of B. Newbery Honor author Catherine Gilbert Murdoch's Da Vinci's Cat is a thrilling time slip fantasy. It will appeal to fans of When You Reach Me and A Wrinkle in Time. And it also features black and white of uh, art of Da Vinci's Cat by Caldecott medalist Paul Ozolinsky throughout. Next. From New National Book Award winning author Catherine Erskine of Mockingbird uh, comes a heartfelt poignant novel that tackles grief, change, and the struggle to let your voice be heard. Lily has been homeschooled her entire life until her dad passes away when she starts public school and discovers the cruel reality of bullies. Following Lily's journey and the snarky, insightful, and humorous commentary from Libro, the actual book, who guides readers through this thoughtful tale makes Lily's Promise a strong title for social emotional learning. Next. Uh, the New York Times bestselling author of Dread Nation makes her middle grade debut with a sweeping tale of the ghosts of our past that won't stay buried, starring an unforgettable girl named Ophie. Justina Ireland has brought her incredible skill of detailed research and writing historical fiction to the middle grade space, telling the story of a young girl living in Jim Crow America as she has to flee from Georgia after her father is murdered by white supremacists. Next. Next is Truly Tyler, the fifth book in the best-selling Emmy and Friends series of full-color graphic novel hybrids, features beloved characters Emmy and Tyler, who is our first boy POV. Next. And then finally, I'd like to tell you about our new titles this summer uh, coming from the Heart Drum imprint. For those of you unfamiliar, Heart Drum is one of our newest imprints here at HarperCollins Children's and is the first wholly native imprint at a major children's publisher. So this one is Jojo McCoon's. It is full of pride, joy, and plenty of humor. This first book in an all new chapter book series by Don Quigley celebrates a spunky young Ojibwe girl who loves who she is. Next. 
With faith, trust, and pixie dust, our next summer book from Heart Drum whisks us off to Neverland. In Cynthia Lydic-Smith's retelling of Peter Pan, stepsisters Wendy, yes, that Wendy, and Muskogee Creek Lily follows the mysterious Peter off to a magical island with their little brother Michael, but all is not what it seems, and Peter may not be as gleeful as he let on. A retelling that uplifts, rather than harmful stereotypes, indigenous peoples, uh, this carries all the magic of the boy who never grew up in this beautiful reimagining. Next. And finally, uh, Brian Young's, who is a Navajo debut novel, a contemporary Navajo hero's journey, features a seemingly ordinary boy who must save the life of a water monster and help his uncle suffering from addiction by discovering his own bravery and boundless love. An outstanding debut from a promising young Navajo author. And one really amazing and unique quality about this book is the bilingual dialogue in both the English and Navajo languages. That, those are just a few of the fantastic middle grade titles we have headed your way this summer. And please check out more in our Edelweiss collection. And as a reminder, these are available on uh, both Edelweiss and NetGalley. Thanks. Uh, so next up we have C.G. Esperanza, also known as Charles George Esperanza, who was born in the South Bronx. When he's not working as an author and illustrator, he works as an art teacher at a senior center. His fresh and unique style and art and textile is on display in his new picture book, Boogie Boogie Y'all, a love letter to the Boogie Down Bronx and a celebration of graffiti art and how it can inspire and bring people together. The beat, rhythm, and energy of the text and the art make it an infectious read aloud. We're hoping he'll do a little read aloud for us today. Please welcome C.G. Esperanza. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. It's so awesome to be here I'm with my, uh, my DJ, Little Cat, over here. And we're so excited to uh, have heard about so many great books today and do a little read along for you guys. Uh, so I created Boogie Boogie Y'all because I am also a teacher in the Bronx. I do a lot of um, visual arts classes for adults to young kids. And one day I realized that the kids in my class didn't recognize that there was an amazing uh, graffiti mural outside of our building. Um, so from then on, I was like, you know, I need to make something that gets kids excited about the art that, you know, local artists are doing in their neighborhood. And that's where the idea for Boogie Boogie All came along. So I am so excited to read the book to you guys today. Um, librarians, <laughs> teachers, <laughs> and picture book lovers of all ages, I welcome you to Boogie Boogie Y'all. One, two, three, let's go. Boogie Boogie Y'all, the city boogied all day. Busy, busy, busy till one kid stopped to say, whoa, y'all, whoa, look at the art on the wall. Whoa, 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 look at the art on the wall. Busy late in a hurry, busy, busy, busy. No one cared at all about the art on the wall. Boogie, boogie, y'all the train, boogie down the track. Everyone was in a hurry, one can stop to clap. Bravo, bravo, look at the art on the train. Bravo, bravo, look at the art on the train. Yuck, gross, horrible, yuck, awful, awful. Everybody complained about the art on the train. Boogie, boogie, y'all the kids boogied in the park. Jump, skip, hop, one dog began to bark. Bow, wow, wow, look at the art in the park. Bow, wow, wow, look at the art in the park. Jump, skip, slide, hit to the hop. No one cared to bark about the art in the park. The boogie down block party boogied in the sun. Up, down, all around the block was having fun. Coco, mango, cherry, yell the man with icy treats while the break crew boogie to a bambayo beat. Everyone was boogieing and having a blast. Just then it happened with a bang and a flash. Boom, Alakazuma, art boogied off the wall. Boom, Alakazuma, art boogied off the wall. Boogie, boogie, y'all, everyone boogied away except two kids, a dog, and cans of paint spray. Clickety clack click, they shook the cans and sprayed. Psst, 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 you won't believe the art they made. Boogie boogie, y'all bang a drum, don't run. The art on the wall makes the block mad fun. Boogie boogie, y'all bang a drum, don't run. The art on the wall makes the block mad fun. The block began to boogie till the block became the art, or the art became the block. I forget that part. Boogie boogie, y'all, we boogie down and had a ball, and that's the tale of how the art came off the wall. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
<laughs> so yeah, this is a story that I'm hoping that young kids and teachers, librarians will all just have a blast reading. And I grew up loving rhyming books, loving hip hop. So I definitely am excited to kind of have more of a, a more of a musical experience with my picture books. Um, my last picture book that I made was Red, Yellow, Blue and A Dash of White too, which I love reading to kids and it's about color mixing and also rhyming and very musical. So I'm definitely always, always excited to do this kind of work. Um, and yeah, I really hope you guys enjoyed the book. If you read it and you love it, feel free to drop, you know, a review, comment somewhere. I'd love to read what everyone thinks about this. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. All right, I don't know how I'm gonna follow that, um, but I am Katie Dutton. I'm very excited to talk to you about some of our other picture books that are coming in summer 2021. Uh, before I dive in, I wanted to remind you that the full interior PDFs of all of our picture books are available on Edelweiss for immediate download. You just go to the place where it says content and the links, um, and then you don't have to wait be, to be approved. You can just download it right away. So this book right here, it's an upbeat picture book from Jacqueline Davies, the award-winning author of children's classic, The Lemonade War, and Sonia Sanchez, the illustrator of Meg Medina's Evelyn Del Rey is Moving Away. This one is perfect for reading aloud. Next. In Bubbles Up, a day at the community pool is full of under underwater magic. Dunking and diving with friends, somersaulting, walking on your hands, and bursting up through the surface like a tortoise. The words swim off the pages as the underwater world comes to life through lush, dynamic illustrations and visual poetry. This book is a perfect free read for kids like me um, who spent their entire summer at the pool, but it's also an incredible read for those who might be anxious or nervous about swimming, since it touches on themes of self-confidence, imagination, self-awareness, and it really helps to show kids how powerful they can be when they believe in themselves. Next slide. From the acclaimed author of Where Are You From comes a stunning second picture book of self-discovery called What Will You Be? Like Where Are You From, this lyrical picture book tells the story of one girl who's asked a simple question that doesn't have a simple answer. Next slide. When the main character is asked what she will be when she grows up, she's expected to answer with a response like doctor, lawyer, or teacher. Instead, she says she will be kind, loving, creative, and compassionate. Shamile has said she wanted to write this story because we rarely see a young girl of color with boundless opportunities and dreams and in charge of her own destiny. Here we see a Latina girl at the forefront and we as readers get to experience the world through her hopeful eyes. This story holds a space for narratives that center joy and light, love and hope. And as you can see here, the art is striking and vibrant. And Kate Alizade does an incredible job of capturing the enchanting magic of Shamile's text. The Spanish version of this book will be published simultaneously and both hit shelves in May. Next slide. Newbery medalist Lynn Ray Perkins invites readers on an imagination fueled journey through the living museum that surrounds us all. Luminous in the moment and full of wonder, the Museum of Everything inspires readers to slow down and appreciate the world. Next slide. When a young girl feels that the world is too big and loud and busy and distracting, and I feel like we all kind of feel that way sometimes, she pretends that she's in a museum. It's quiet there, she can wonder about everything. Is a rock in a puddle an island? Is a dry spot on the ground on a snowy day the shadow of a car that's just driven off? There's a museum for everything, for islands and shadows and clouds and trees and so much more. Lynn Ray Perkins balances imagination and creativity with curiosity and facts. She's created the extraordinary artwork in this book in three dimensions, as if each page is an exhibit or installation in a museum. A transcendent and timely picture book, The Museum of Everything encourages young readers to wonder, dream, and explore, and to learn more about the world around them. Next slide. This picture book adaptation of Cat Stevens's legendary anthem of unity and harmony, Peace Train, comes just in time for the song's 50th anniversary. Next. 
featuring the timeless lyrics of the classic song and illustrated by the incomparable and beloved Peter H. Reynolds. This hopeful book invites readers to join together in peace and harmony and unite the world with love for all. Next slide. And this final picture book that I'm going to talk about today is called What If Pig by debut author illustrator Lindsay Hunter. When Pig gets the brilliant idea to throw a party for Mouse and their friends, he can't help but think of everything that could possibly go wrong. After all, what if a lion eats all the invitations? What if nobody comes? Or worse, what if everyone comes and has an awful time? Next slide. In this adorable story, Lindsay's charming, bright illustrations pair perfectly with the sweet and funny story about friendship and the endless wonder of what if that readers of all ages can relate to. This book is not only adorably quirky and charming, but it's also incre an incredible title for social emotional learning with themes of self-management, self-awareness, and social awareness. At its core, it's a story about friendship as Mouse serves as a voice of reason for Pig, providing stability when Pig's anxious thoughts start to spiral. You can see an, an illustration of that right there. I love the way that these illustrations convey emotions so simply and so well, both the worry and anxiety that you see in these spreads and the joy and hope you see in others throughout Pig's emotional journey. And that's it for picture books. Thank you for listening. And then real quick, I just want to tell you about I Can Read Comics. So I know you all know the I Can Read line that's been around for decades. So we are thrilled to introduce I Can Read Comics as part of both the I Can Read line and our graphic novel imprint, Harper Alley. These early graphic novels are leveled the same way as the rest of the I Can Read books with level one, two, or three. Next slide, please. Um, but each book also has a guide on how to read graphic novels. Visual literacy is a huge skill in today's media rich world. And these are the perfect introduction to developing reading of both words and pictures. Um, these first titles will go on sale in June. Hi, it's Patty again. Um, Here's um, some information about Edelweiss and NetGalley, which we've mentioned a number of times. We just want to make sure you don't miss it. Um, and here is Mimi's uh, contact information if you want to get in touch with us that way. Um, and here are our social um, links to our social handles. So follow us, please. Um, I think that we have a question for Rita. Um, Stephanie, well, why don't I ask it? The question that I saw was, Rita, are you there? Can you, uh, do you have time for a question? You just would need to unmute. Unmute. Yeah, there you go. Look at you. You can like hey, a pro at this Zoom thing. I am here. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question is, what surprised you in your research? Okay, one of the very first things was a reminder to not begin with any preconceived notions and to just be ready, be prepared to learn. Um, and the first thing that I learned was that um, th the first uh, definitions of who was a who was considered Creole in Louisiana or in the territory in the Louisiana territory were the uh, were the French and and also the uh, the Spanish settlers the the descendants of those uh, first French and Spanish settlers and that they um, were Catholic. Um, and, and um, so uh, they were, uh, so these were um, descendants of the first Europeans. Those were the first Creoles. Um, and, uh, and so uh, it amazed me that, <laughs> that there were white Creoles. I, I thought, well, Cajuns, yes, but you see, so you cannot start with, um, you can't start with um, preconceived notions. You have to come ready to learn. And then um, uh, Creoles evolved to what we know now, which is that kind of mixture and diversity of European, African, Caribbean, uh, Native American um, uh, people uh, joining and mix, make creating a culture that becomes what we know as the Creole culture. Great, thank you, Rita. Good advice for all of us, isn't it? <laughs> um, one last question, and this is for Aaron. Um, is there a sequel coming to Marisol? Yes, so as it stands now, it's a three book series. So the sequel is scheduled for next year and each book will be Marisol kind of overcoming 
a thing that she's afraid of that she doesn't think that anyone else is afraid of. So the first book is her learning to climb a tree. And the second book is still in the works, but will probably have something to do with sports. Yeah, well, I can um, relate to that, Erin, and I think maybe some of our uh, viewers can too, maybe some. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Charles. What a great job you did. What an awesome read aloud. Um, you know, lots of us do read aloud, so to, to hear you do it was, uh, was really great, really terrific. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, you bet. Thank you for being with us. And um, I think that's it. I think I'm going to pop it over to Booklist. They might have a couple of... Uh, a final housekeeping things for everyone. Again, thanks everyone for coming and being with us today. Um, we loved having you here. Thanks a million. Thank you so much, Patty. And thank you again also to Charles, Aaron, and Rita for your fantastic presentations, just like jaw droppingly good. Um, and another huge thank you to all of today's wonderful panelists. Tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's slide presentation, title list, certificate of completion, and video recording. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit www.booklistonline.com slash webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones like the ones you see here. If you haven't already, please be sure to check out the Booklist Reader, where Booklist contributors post about all things books and library land. Not yet a subscriber? Pair the page-by-page -page reading experience of print with the convenience of online access at booklistonline.com and lock in print, online, digital, and archive access by taking advantage of this special webinar offer to get Booklist for only $75. While you're perusing Booklist Online, be sure to check out Book Links, a quarterly supplement to Booklist perfect for educators and school librarians. It is now freely available to all. To start reading, type booklinks.booklistonline.com into your web browser. Did you, did you know registration for ALA's virtual annual conference and exhibition is now open? Taking place between June 23rd and 29th, this year's conference will feature amazing speakers, educational programming, and an opportunity to connect with colleagues and librarians everywhere. Plus, if you register before April 16th, you'll save on registration rates. Visit 2021.alaannual.org for more. And finally, thank you again for joining us for today's webinar. And one more thank you to our sponsor, HarperCollins Children's Books. This concludes today's webinar.